Er, uh, I mean, <clears throat> greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 18 of Project Odyssey. In this episode, we need to send a probe to Jewel and return it back to Kerbin as quickly as possible so that we can collect some of the gas that's in the upper atmosphere of Jewel and bring that back here for the medicine that is going to actually cure Hadfield. Because as you know from previous episodes, Hadfield's cure from Minmus is only temporary. That's why we're launching this vessel right here. This one's name is Save Hadfield because it contains the jewel probe that is going to go and collect that gas, bring it back, and make that medicine. I'll be using a maneuver node to determine exactly where I want to leave Kerbin, so I'm going to send this up into a low parking orbit first. Whoops! I forgot to turn on the RCS before I decoupled the first stage, and the extra torque that that causes sort of bends the nose down a little, but we're really high up, so I recover it fairly easily here, and once we have that pointed the right way, it's time to power up, and now, now I can do what I was saying, where I'm going to try and put us into a low parking orbit first, and then we'll figure out where we want to go to get to Jewel, set up a maneuver node, and then leave our parking orbit and head over there. Here's a nice little up-close view before it actually decouples from the Centaur where you get to see the satellite there. I'll show this in the VAB in a moment here because I'm doing something a little bit different from what I normally would do. And that's just in the construction of this rocket. I'm also doing something different in the way that I'm launching it. If you notice that after I launched it and I powered up the Centaur, I haven't shut it down. I'm trying to not actually go up to my apoapsis and circularize. I'm trying to burn straight into a low orbit, pretty much the exact same way that a rocket would if it were here on Earth. The basic idea of how I'm doing that is I essentially, once I got my apoapsis to 70 kilometers, I made sure that I had been going slow enough that my time to apoapsis, which you can see in the MechJeb flight computer window right there, was really low, like 10 seconds or lower. So if you continue just pointing right at that horizon line, there will be no gravity drag, you'll be at 70 kilometers, and just by trying to keep that time to apoapsis at very, very close to zero, you get yourself into a parking orbit, just like that, with only one burn. Now before I go any further in the actual launch of this thing, I want to come into the VAB and show you what's going on because it's probably going to be a while before you really get to see it in action. It's going to be in a different video because I'm going to let some time go by to really simulate that whole idea of there being some time associated with these launches. Now you have seen everything down here before. You don't need anything below the centaur and the fairing. So that brings us to the payload itself, and you can see that I'm representing the idea of there being massive amounts of radiation at a planet like Jewel, just like there would be a massive amount of radiation at Jupiter. And so this large shell, which opens up here like a cargo bay, it is a cargo bay technically, that is my radiation shielding. I'm sort of waving my hands in the air a little and saying, it's radiation shielding. So yeah, we'll just go with that. Now the bottom is fairly simple. You know, your engines and some solar panels, communications fuel, and check it out right here. Say it with me, Kerbinauts. More lights. Okay, but forget about that for the moment. We need to look at what's going on with these solar panels. How are you going to get enough power to power this thing all the way out at Joule with those little solar panels? Well, I'm not. Those are just a tiny supplemental electrical source. The main electricity is going to come from three RTGs that are all around the outside here at the top. Those are what's powering it. But I noticed that the RTGs were just a tiny bit not enough. And therefore, with these quite large solar panels that are only going to generate about 5% of the power that they will here at Kerbin once they get to Joule, these solar panels, even with that little amount, will provide that little extra that will allow me to operate that, that tiny bit it needs in order to 
keep all these things going like this gigantic it's the first time i've used this one this is my 200 gigameter dish that i have on the end of it and it's got its cpu and all of the innards here which look kind of cool in my opinion gigantic battery because who knows how much electrical power i'm going to need although really all i need to do is open up this mystery goo containment unit one time, close it back up, and head back to Kerbin. If we fly through the upper atmosphere of Jewel and open that up, I'm going to say that that's enough to actually collect all the gas necessary to save Hadfield. So it's just a flyby. We're not going to orbit. We're just going to fly by right through the atmosphere there. And anyway, all the rest of it in here is your basics, you know, RCS, monopropellant there, one gyroscope and a couple CPUs to control things like the antenna, the dishes, the, the attitude and control and then you'll see this this actually extends out but that will be in a future episode but you can sort of see what's going on in there it has a camera and some joints that will allow it to be operated by infernal robotics here extending it out in a way to collect that gas and to bring it home now there's a couple radiators on the side. Another thing to note here is I had some struts that were going between this and the fairing. I forgot that normally now what I wanna do when I'm connect connecting struts to a fairing is I wanna put this decoupler on there first and then attach the strut to that and then have it go out to the fairing. Because what happens is, and if you were watching closely when I decoupled the fairing, instead of it popping out and away safely, it actually just floated right by the craft very close as it went away. And that's because this strut, until a frame after you've decoupled the fairing, is actually holding it down. So that force of the fairing popping away breaks that strut, but, it doesn't break it before the strut has actually held it from flying away and instead it goes down. I've mentioned that in a past video and I totally forgot to put that decoupler on there. I'll try to remember in the next time. Okay, that's it for the save Hadfield except for one more thing. So you might be wondering, how do I know? Now some of you are probably experienced at this and this isn't really super useful, but some of you may not be. And you might be wondering, how do I know exactly how big of a rocket I need to go to Jewel and come back home again? Now you can see I have my MechJab customized Delta V window, which is really one of the only two things I use MechJab for. I use it for this Delta V readout and I use it for the customizable flight computer where I can actually put all all of the lines that I want when you see that uh, it's not showing here where there it is flight computer so let's say I allow it in the editor right so all of these lines I've showed in a previous video that I can put them in whatever I want wherever I want now there's another mod called Kerbal Engineer, which lets you do something similar where you see this stuff, but it's not customizable. And so in my opinion, that makes MechJab better than Kerbal Engineer for this sort of readout. I don't actually use it for any kind of autopiloting stuff. I just use it for the readouts, but it's better. So there you have it. Okay, getting back to the Delta V window, you can see all the different stages I have here, the different thrust to weight ratios at the different stages, the total amount of Delta V at all the different stages. And by looking Looking at these, I know that I should be able to very easily get to Joule and back again before Joule has made one complete orbit of the sun. And that's my criteria for successfully saving Hadfield, is I have to be able to get there and back again before Joule makes one orbit. Okay, so the next thing is, how much delta V did I know to put on each of these stages? Well, the basic idea is you have to have enough to lift off, of course, and when you're in Ferrum Aerospace, that's about 3200 delta V. You can see that I have 2200 just on the two stages at the bottom here, which leaves me with another 1000 that will help me get into a parking orbit right here in the Centaur. That leaves me with another 3245 that I can use for the Centaur to power my way over to Joule. So the question is, is 3245 enough? And is 1466, which is what's in the satellite, enough to get home? 
One thing to note here though is that the Centaur probably will have a little bit extra fuel left over when it's done making its burn. I haven't figured it out exactly, but I believe it'll have a little left over. I'm not going to use it though on any part of the trip because I'm pretending that it's a cryogenic uh, second stage, which means that I'm basically going to have to burn it until it's got its ejection orbit and then decouple it because the fuel in real life wouldn't last long enough to make it all the way to some mid-course correction point. To do that, you're going to want some kind of fuel that lasts out there like UDMH. So that's what I'm pretending that I have in my actual satellite here. It's probably powered by UDMH and N204. The last step in this process is making sure we have enough fuel so we're going to begin with a delta V map like we have here and then start right down here by Kerbin. The number on there is the amount of fuel right above Kerbin 4500 that it would take in order to go up into that low orbit of 70 kilometers if I were in stock. Remember I'm using Ferrum Aerospace so for me it's only 3200. After that, it's going to be the same whether it's stock or whether it's ferrum because once you're out in space, the, the aerodynamic model doesn't matter. So for my Centaur stage, I'm going to start adding up all the numbers that are on the line from low orbit all the way to Joule. And you can see here, we have a 680 and a 180, 70, 20, 130, 480, and 370. Next to Kerbin Joule Transfer, there is a, three or a 270 in green in parentheses. That represents what I might have to spend for an inclination change, so therefore I'm going to add that to my craft just in case I need that. After that, you can see there are red arrows that point all the way into Joule, meaning that I can arrow break if I wanted to stop there. All I have to do is fly through the upper atmosphere of Joule, so I don't have to pay any of the Delta V cost anywhere along that line that goes all the way to Joule. I will have to pay some fuel in order to return back to Kerbin and set my path. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep as much fuel in there as it would take to actually come home had I been at Joule. And so I'm just going to add the whole 370, 480, 130 all the way back again. Technically, I shouldn't need that much because the red arrows going back to Kerbin indicate that I can arrow break to get back at Kerbin as well. But I don't want to go too too low into the atmosphere because there's no heat shields on this. I want to slow down. I don't want to burn up. And this finally brings us back here to the save Hadfield where we can see how much we had before right there. That Centaur now we can see has enough that it's going to be able to get us not only into our low orbit and finalize our parking orbit, but it's got plenty in order to make the transfer over to Joule if you add up all those numbers. Also, a 1466 is more than enough to come home had we been orbiting there, much less the fact that we're really just doing a flyby and then coming straight back. So this should be enough to get us there and back and then some. Before going into the VAB, we had just finished getting into our parking orbit, so here we are back here again and I need to set up the communications. That big 200 gigameter dish is going to point at Kerbin, and we're still going to need a communication satellite that will be able to talk to this once it gets further away. Now it's time to set the maneuver node, but when I went out to take a look at it, I found this site, which was really cool looking to me. Look at all the satellites that are already on their way heading, well, these are all heading to Duna, but we're about to add two more to this mix. We're going to go down here, grab a maneuver node, extend that out until we have an ejection, then pull on it until it gets kind of close to the orbit of Joule, where I've already selected my target. Once that's set, we'll go back down here and make sure that ejection angle is pointing directly away from where we want to go. Oh, it's gone too far, so we pull back a little bit more. Saw it intercept there for a second, and there we go. Now we have the intercept at Joule. We just need to go make sure that it's still pointing correctly in the right direction. Go back to Joule and see how close we're getting. For now, that's probably pretty close. 
Now we'll just zip ahead in time until we can get to that maneuver node and begin our ejection heading over toward Jewel. Now right about now you might be thinking, hey that last episode was so awesome, why aren't we going to get one of those every single time I watch your stuff? Well, I'll tell you, it takes about 90 real time minutes for me to put together one minute of video. And that last one was 42 minutes long, so if you do the math, that means it took me about 63 hours hours to completely put that all together and that's with most of those sets having already been made. It takes me a couple hours usually to put together one brand new set and I only did two new ones for that episode. I did the bedroom and I did the alternate dimension control room. The rest of it was all from two hours here and two hours there putting together previous episodes and so once I finally had so many different sets and I had that story to tell about Svetlana, that's why I decided, you know what, I now have enough different sets that I can put together probably a show. And I did that. And I might do it again in the future, but I'm not going to be able to spend that kind of time every single week, that's for sure. If I did like one video per month, I might be able to do something like that, but I, I can't do it every week. Okay, so you can see that I finished that burn, and right now I'm using my RCS to do a little bit more maneuvering to get us a little closer. It wasn't going through the atmosphere of Jewel yet, but we'll be able to get that after we do a mid-course correction. Now, you might be thinking, hey, I wish we had some of those cinematics. Well, I'll tell you what, we're not going to let an episode go by with absolutely nothing in it now, are we? I want that status report on Svetlana. It's been two days. You still have nothing? Not a thing, sir. The portal just never opened. Something must have happened on the other side. We can't get her on any comm channels either. All right, listen up, people. I need another computer up in the RTCC. I want everybody to alert your support teams. Wake up anybody you need. Get them in here. Let's work the problem, people. I want ideas by 0900. We left our Joule satellite on an escape trajectory, leaving Kerbin, so I'm going to let it fast forward a bit here until it makes it all the way out, at which point I'll be able to take a quick look at the orbit and make sure I still like it, and after that, I'm going to launch a second one. The second one is because Bill is a stickler for redundancy now, and he wants two copies of everything, because what would happen if the first one didn't make it there or make it back? And and then we would have no way to save Hadfield. So a second launch of the exact same rocket is going up. But this one is going to have a slightly different trajectory. I will show you that in just a minute. I also must mention that there's a couple more launches coming up. We need to send communications that will be able to keep track of these because the satellite dishes that are down at Mission Control are not going to be enough to keep in contact all the time as Kerbin is rotating. With the second flight here, you can see what we're trying to do is get there quicker. We're using up a lot more Delta V, 3567 for this maneuver, but that's because we want to have this other one that if the first one doesn't work, the second one, which is actually the first one we launched, will be able to make its attempt. So this one is going to use a lot more Delta V, try to get there and come back on whatever is little is left out of that 4400, hopefully being able to make it back on that. If it doesn't, then we have the second one and that will handle Bill's requirement for redundancy because we can't screw this up. If Hadfield doesn't get this medicine, he will not survive. Once again, we're waiting for our maneuver node to come around. Just a little fast forwarding here, zip around, power up, and off we go. Now you might be noticing that a lot of times what I'll do is I will clear my maneuver node, I'll delete it before I've actually reached the end of the burn. And that's because I don't care about the maneuver node once the maneuver has started. All I care about is getting as close as possible to the target. And the maneuver node was just a guess. I want to visually inspect whether or not I'm getting close enough. And I'll do that simply by deleting the node, just like that, and then powering up. And as we get close to the target, we'll just keep an eye on where that intercept is. And when the intercept gets where I want it to be, that's when I'll power down. I forget about the maneuver at that point. 
So that's what's happening here. By selecting Jewel, it allows me to zoom in a little bit closer. Right when that close approach gets there and the intercept happens, we can zoom in nice and close to Jewel. Watch as the expected orbit comes really tight. And look at that, that one is going through the atmosphere. We'll still need to make a mid-course correction in order to get ourselves home and actually that's the mid-course correction that's what i'm worried about on maybe not making it back now right here i'm double checking i can see that we have a great intercept with jewel the question is will we have enough fuel to also get home and that's why we have that backup satellite the one that's going a little bit slower to get there but neither of them is going to be coming home if we don't have any way of controlling them. And we have remote tech running, which means we need to have some satellites that will actually send signals to those things and tell them what to do when they get there and tell them how to get back home again. But at the same time, we do not currently have our fuel resupply mission completed, which means the moon is not sending anything to us. And so we have to go up on solid rocket boosters with this satellite. We are almost completely dried out on any kind of liquid fuel. I think I need to set up some sort of special booster that's for when I'm launching only by solid rocket booster because I had a little bit of trouble getting this one launched. First we begin with me setting the thrust on the SRB to be about 1.2 thrust to weight, but completely forgetting about the fact that I've also set them up to actually begin their launch at about 80% thrust, which meant it didn't have enough thrust to actually even begin moving. Version 2 had a 1.5 thrust to weight at ground with, so that when in combination with the 80% initial thrust, it could actually start moving just a little bit. However, by default my SRBs are pre-programmed to throttle back to go through max Q, and that's expecting that they're going to be on liquid launchers which will maintain a certain minimum thrust. Well when you don't have that minimum thrust, you have trouble getting high enough and out of the atmosphere and you start to spin. Around and around she goes and where she stops nobody knows other than when you meet the ground then you're going to stop. So I decided for number three I would add a couple minor solid rocket boosters on the side but that I would not actually ignite them until the main one was starting to lose thrust. But I forgot to account for the increased mass and I need to up my thrust controller again on that main booster. So we're once again down to less than one thrust to weight technically when we start our liftoff. But after that little tweak in the VAB to that thrust on the SRB, we were finally able to get it up into orbit and here it is. It's beginning to deploy and you can see that one is fairly interesting. And here's Joulecom. Like I had mentioned earlier, this is completely solid rocket booster propelled. You can see it has little ones on the side, which I activate after the big one is going. The little ones are just to give it an extra push when the big one has dropped down its throttle for max Q. You can see here that I've done the thrust limiter, and this is what I was talking about when I said that I had scaled it down. Notice over here it says the thrust to weight ratio, and I had tried to put it down to about 1.2, like this, one time, except that meant that when I took off it was actually going less than that because these are pre-programmed to start at only a lower thrust. So then I bumped it up again, and then we had added the small ones to the sides, but I didn't look over here to see that this had dropped, and so I needed to bump it again, and finally I got it up to a higher number like that. Now if we work our way up here, you can see that it was totally solid rocket booster all the way up until underneath here where we have the satellite. And this time around, I didn't just put lights on there, I put colored lights. Why not? So it's going to be over here at Kerbin, unlike the stuff that's actually going to Joule, and that's why we just have normal solar panels on there. I threw on my batteries here and here. We have our larger engine, because it's a little bit heavier. Sometimes I would use a smaller one there, but we got this newer big one. It's attached right up there underneath those 
three, fu yeah, three fuel tanks. We have some RCS jets here and here and here. They only point in two directions, and so that's why I have a couple pointing that way, a couple pointing that way. These were exactly where I needed them to be in order to make them balanced using the RCS build aid over here. Moving our way up, you can see I put an avionics ring on there for computer control because I thought it looked cool. We have big tanks of monopropellant. Uh, again, it's no real reason. We have enough monopropellant. It's the liquid fuel that we're running low on. So I threw it on here because it looked cool and Bill didn't care. No one cared that we were using up mono since we had plenty of that. Up at the top, you can see that we have our gyroscope here, little antenna. These are the ones that will come out and they will extend like this on the sides. And there'll be two of those, and so it'll look a little bit like a Tedris satellite, but it's sort of like a big, thick version of one. And there you have it. Back here in orbit, you can see that this satellite, it isn't fully deployed yet, but it's not where it wants to be either. We are currently making our way into what is called a Molnia orbit. That means we're going very polar and very high. It means lightning in Russian, and it's a type of highly eccentric orbit that spends most of its time in the neighborhood of its apoapsis. That means it will very rarely be blocked by carbon or anything else while trying to communicate with the long-range targets like the Save Minmus gas collector satellites. In our world, this sort of orbit is highly effective to provide very high-latitude communications. Just a couple more steps and this one is ready. We bring out the radiators, open up the dishes, point them at the two satellites on their way to Jewel, the Save Minmus 1, and I'll rename one of them to be the Save Minmus 2 so I can tell them apart. The middle one is pointed at Kerbin and will communicate with the Tedris satellites. And then when I went out here to look, notice right there where the mouse is, that little sparkling dot, I'm using the Distant Objects mod and I noticed that sparkle going by. It turns out that was the Odyssey station flying by the curb in there. Pretty cool. So a quick recap here, we have two satellites on the way to Jewel. We have one coming up here that it'll intercept there. We have another one coming way over here that it'll intercept right there. Both of them are going to need mid-course corrections so that they both intercept Jewel going through the atmosphere and make it back to Kerbin. Once they come back to Kerbin in a few years, I am going to be able to capture them at Kerbin where I'll send something up to uh, some sort of ship that will go up and it will recover that gas and then we can save Hadfield. Meanwhile, we have down here this Molnia orbit, way going way up there, that will provide the communications link to those two satellites. And that's what we've gotten done so far in this episode. Also, if anybody was wondering why are those intercepts so high, why are they coming way up here and coming back down again rather than just going straight out and hitting the opposing orbit and coming back? Well, that's because it would take more delta V to actually make a direct intercept with Joule. The launch window had already gone by, so I'm going up higher because if I went straight to the orbit, I would be coming back in front of Joule. I need to go high to slow myself down giving Jewel enough time to catch up to me so that on my way back through, we can get the intercept. The normal launch window for Jewel relative to where I am right here is probably somewhere around over there. So we're uh, a little late, basically. If Kerbin had been maybe back around here, it's way over here now. If it had been back over here, that would have been a good launch window to make it to Jewel. And I want to go now rather than waiting until Kerbin has gone all the way back around over to here again, which is going to be quite a while. It's almost another year to get back over there. I don't think we'll be held against the wheels. Here comes the boss. Quiet down, everyone. You've had all day to figure this out. What have you come up with? Well, sir, we think there are two explanations. She is unable to respond. She is unwilling to respond. Thank you, genius. What's your proposal for unable to respond? 
Well, she either can't because something happened to her comm device, or they're stopping her. If it's calm, we could send a new one through the wormhole to her side. But then they might take it from her if they were stopping her. In that case, we could send a rescue mission. And for the unwilling to respond? Again, send a mission, but this time to bring her back by force. Okay, we'll send a mission. If she's being held, then we want to come in by stealth. If she's unwilling, we want to come in by stealth. So in either case, we want to come in by stealth. You, what's your name again? Igor, sir. Access the science archives and see what the state of the cloaking device was. Was it finished before the cataclysm, or do we still have work to do on it? I want to send a cloaked ship on a mission to acquire their Corbomite device, find Svetlana, and bring them both back here. Yes, yes sir! sir. Svetlana. Come in. I was just listening to some of your Dimensions music. It's unique. So, how are you? Is the leg better? Much. Neil has been taking good care of me. And how are you doing with your decision to stay? Well, your team here seems like they really want to help me get back home. It just reassures me I made the right decision, and I have faith they'll do what they can for me. So, Kranz asked me to talk to you about that. He thinks you can help us while you're here. Anything. With Joseph still in Minmus, Kessel needs help rebuilding a new Corbomite device for our Mun refueling project. And with Jebediah on Minmus, we have no truly experienced pilots to oversee the Mun mission. We were going to send it 100% unmanned, but now, with you here, we could have you go check on things. Just make sure it's all set up and working, and return home. Sure, that sounds like fun! Well, that's about it for this time. We're going to leave it right there. I do need to get up to the moon and start working on getting that cathane and converting that fuel because we are down to the last drops of liquid that we have. We've been doing a bunch of stuff on solid rocket boosters lately, so it's really time to get up there and do what we said we were going to with those missions. I'm experimenting, therefore, with some landers and assembly rovers again. I think I have an idea of how to do something a little bit more stable than the last time I was working on this. I've added some parts. I've got a new cathane radial drill and a few other things that I'm going to be including in my installation to make it possible to go to the moon and do those things and maybe some other stuff as well. We might be making some mid-course corrections by advancing the game, just letting it fast forward a little bit because not much time has really gone by since I launched those original Duna missions and I think I might want to just let it go a little bit forward and work on that. And also, we might need to see what's up with Sergei next time. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts. And action. Oh, 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 damn it. Cut. Let's do that one more time. Action. But, Sergey, come on, lay off the sauce. Cameraman, make sure you keep them in the frame. Let's try that by going around the front this time. And action. Oh, ah, ow, oh, my head. Uh, uh. E, uh. Cut. Back to first positions, we're doing it again.